Welcome to Dahlonega United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Robin Parr. I'm the Associate Minister at Dahlonega United Methodist Church, and we are so glad that you have joined us this morning on this cold, snowy morning uh, as we come and we worship with you in your homes uh, and hope that you are warm and safe. Please know that uh, if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to Steve or me. You can always contact us via our cell phone and we will try to help you in any way we can. But we do hope that you are warm and safe on this snowy Sunday morning. I'd like to begin this morning by reading uh, a scripture that comes from John and we're going to continue. Last week we talked about Jesus and uh, his baptism, but of course we also uh, read from Matthew in the account of the wise men and uh, what epiphany means. And that last week, epiphany for us meant for us to seek the light in our baptismal covenants. And so we're going to continue that story uh, now through John's gospel. And I'm going to pick this up uh, in John 1. And I am going to start on verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. You will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had to say and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find the brother, his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, meaning that we know there that Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, looked at Simon, and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that we can come and worship you no matter where we are. Today, holy God, we ask that you reveal to us what it means, what our name means. Not just what our earthly name means, but what our heavenly name means. The name that you have given to us as a new creation. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Speak to us today, for your children are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we heard in our scripture in John that Jesus is already telling Peter, Peter, you're going to have a new name. And that name is going to be changed from Cephas, from Simon to Cephas. And of course, Cephas, when translated, means Peter. So we know Peter as the rock. His name is changed from Simon to Peter. But this is not the first time nor the last time that God is going to change somebody's name. We can go all the way back to Abram and Sarah. And we know that their name has changed. Their name has changed to Abraham and to Sarah because Abraham is going to be uh, the one who is the father of, of all nations. Sarah is going to become the mother of, of all nations. And so their names are changed. We keep going. Jacob, Jacob, we know that he was a deceiver, a schemer. And, and the, the fact that as he was, he was born a twin and as he's coming out, he's gripping Esau, his brother's heel, you know, that he's going to be the usurper. But when he wrestles with God, God changes his name to Israel, to Israel, because now he has wrestled with God and, and he's, he's won. He's won. We also continue to see other areas in which God changes people's names. 
if we look at, of course, after uh, a Peter, we see Paul. And that Paul starts out as Saul. And it, it's not a coincidence that Saul kind of sounds like Sheol. Sheol, Saul and Sheol. That's, that, that's not just a play on words. We know that Sheol is uh, another word for, for hell or the depths. And so when Paul is Saul, he is living a sinful life. He is living a life that's, that's blind, that's in the depths. But when God comes on him, when Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and he is blinded, in those three days, just like Jesus is in the tombs, in the depth of Sheol, in the tomb for three days, that, that Saul, too, is there and that he's having to wrestle with everything he's done. And so when he comes out of that, he is given a new name and his new name is Paul. So, yes, we have a reason for these names to be changed. Peter, who is Simon. His name is going to be changed because he will be the rock. The cornerstone is Jesus. And on the cornerstone will be the cornerstone, meaning the church itself. The church will be built on the rock, who is Peter. The cornerstone is Jesus. And on that cornerstone sits Peter. And, and that is exactly what God is saying to him, that, that you, that I have decided that you are going to be the rock, the rock in which I build my church. I, Jesus, am the cornerstone, but I will build my church on you. And so, yes, he's given a new name. Last week, when we were uh, talking about Remember your baptism. Remember the rocks that you receive, the stones that you receive. I chose those, almost white stones, as a reminder of what it says in Revelation 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So at some point in time, and, and you notice too, it says that, and, and of course this translation says to the one who conquers. Now last week, I read a translation that says to the one who is a victor, to the victors. And, and what that means, conquer, victor, it simply means those who have found Christ Jesus and who have lived for him, who have, have held fast to what it means to, to know Jesus intimately and to be his witness in all the worlds, to be a disciple and to make, a, make disciples. That's what it means. Those who have obtained eternal life. And so at some point in time, we are going to stand before Jesus. We're going to stand before God and he is going to give us that pure white stone and on it will be a name that only we know and God knows. And in that moment, we too, just like Abraham and Sarah and Peter and Paul, we're going to receive that new name. But we have a new name even now. We are born with a name. I, My mother tells a story that uh, she saw me before I was born and that an angel told her that my name was to be Robin Elizabeth. And whether that's true or not true, and I, and I do believe that it's true, it has sustained me all of my life. Even in the darkest, hardest times of my life, my mother's gift of telling me that story has always made me understand that God has a purpose for my life, that, that he has named me, just as he's named you, whatever your name is here on earth. I believe that, that God has named you. That's your earthly name. And he did that because he gave you those parents who gave you that name. But he does change our names. The moment that we believe, the moment that we uh, seek to know him, 
that when we come before him and say, yes, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of saving. And I know that you have saved me. I know that you are the Christ. And I want to gain that victory. I want to gain eternal life. And so when we give our lives over to him, he does change our name. And that name, our name becomes Christian. We go from simply being a human being made, yes, in God's image, to the actual son and daughter of Christ. And when we become a son and daughter of Christ, when we are adopted into the family of God, at that moment, we become Christian, our Christ-like. Our name does change, and we become a new creation. And so on this snowy Sunday morning, as we look at all of the wonders of God and see what he is doing in this world, even in the middle of chaos and even in the middle of, of so much turmoil and sickness and even despair, that God is still making all things new. And that if we will turn to him, if we will believe in him, we will become a new creation. And we will gain a new name even now. That name of Christian. And one day, one day, there will come a time when we will meet Jesus face to face. And he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You are the victor because you believed and because you chose to live a holy life. Because you chose to tell others about me. Because you chose to stand up for me. Because you chose to allow me to change not just your name, but your whole being. And because of this, I'm going to give you a name that is eternal. I don't know about you, but that keeps me going, even in the hardest of days, to know and to believe that one day Jesus will call me a victor, that he will say, I love you, and he will hand me that pure white stone etched with the name of eternity. So this morning, Remember that. Remember that as you look at the snow. Remember that. Even if you're without power. Remember that he is the power and the glory. That just as this fire that burns. That the Holy Spirit is burning a fire that's even brighter and hotter and greater inside of you. And that that fire is etching your new name. So come, Holy Spirit, come, etch that new name inside of us, a name that we don't just keep for ourselves, but a name that others see in us. They look at us and they say, there's something about her or him that's different. a name that is Christian, Christ-like, that when someone looks at us, Lord, that they see Christ in us, that we carry the name of Christ in us, etched in us and on us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we so desire that today. Help us to God always. To remember that we carry your name. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen.
Greetings from La Magdalena. It's a blessing to be here. Yes. So thank you. Greetings from La Magdalena. <laughs> we are well loved here. Yeah. Amen. We are Great. one in Christ. Amen. Good morning. I am uh, coming to you from La Magdalena, El Salvador. Um, I'm pre-recording this sermon because I think uh, we may be having a snowstorm in Dahlonega today. And uh, anyway, I'm pre-recording a sermon for you all to, uh, and it will help you understand what we're doing here. So um, I'm with a team of 11 people uh, from our church who have been down here for a week. Uh, building uh, seventh and eighth grade buildings. Uh, the gift for those buildings was provided by uh, some members of our church. And uh, it's just been a real blessing to uh, the school and the children of the community. And uh, we've just experienced uh, joy and happiness. And, you know, it's hard work. We've been doing a lot of uh, shoveling and pickaxing we're moving a lot of i'll show you in, at the close of the sermon i'll show you a little bit about what we've been doing working at, uh, getting the foundation ready uh, to pour the, the floor now, the foundation of the walls are down but uh, the floor and so we've had to be uh, busting up some some lava rock which is pretty difficult and uh, hauling it off in wheelbarrows and uh, doing this in the in the a 90 degree heat and I know it's cold back home but uh, it is hot here so um, but there's a great joy to it and you you may ask yourself why uh, why would people uh, leave their comfortable homes and go to a faraway place uh, eat strange food and keep odd hours and do intensive labor in the very hot sun um, and we're going to talk about that because it's God's will. Our Old Testament lesson today is from uh, Proverbs. And Proverbs um, 19, verses 22 and uh, 23. And this is in the Passion Translation. A man is charming when he displays tender mercies to others. And a lover of God who is poor and promises nothing is better than a rich liar who never keeps his promises. When you live a life of abandoned love, surrendered before the awe of God, here's what you'll experience. Abundant life, continual protection, and complete satisfaction. Now, who doesn't want that? A life surrendered to God. I want you to notice it says it's better to say nothing than to promise something and then not fulfill it. And then our uh, our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesians, chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner of the Lord, I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank given to you in your divine calling. With tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially toward those who may try your patience. Be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Holy Spirit among you in the bonds of peace, being one body and one spirit as you are all called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. For the Lord is one, and so are we. For we share in one faith, one baptism, and one Father. And the Father is the perfect Father who leads us all, works through us all, and lives in us all. So we see that uh, our divine calling as those who are in Christ is to be unified, be patient with each other, especially the ones that are difficult. And uh, we're experiencing that this week as we are thrust together 
working in very difficult circumstances. People who previously didn't know each other very well. And working alongside Salvadorians from a different culture. From, and yet we, we work together as one team because we're united in Christ. There's one God, one Lord one faith, one baptism. And so when we've entered into that covenant with God, we come together, juntos en español, and we work together. Somos unidos en Cristo. Our gospel is from uh, Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verses 20, 28 through um, 32. Jesus said to his critics, tell me what you think of this parable. There once was a man with two sons. The father came to the first and said, son, I want you to go out and work in the vineyard today. The son replied, I'd rather not. But afterward, he deeply regretted what he said to his father, changed his mind and decided to go to the vineyard. The father approached the second son and said the same thing to him. The son replied, father, I will go and do as you said. But he never did. He didn't go to the vineyard. Tell me, which one of these two sons did the will of his father? They answered him, the first one. Jesus said, you're right. For many sinners, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into God's kingdom ahead of you. John came to show you the path of goodness and righteousness. Yet the despised and the outcast believed in him, but you did not. When you saw them turn, you neither repented your ways nor believed in his words. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto thee, my rock and my redeemer. Lord, as... Uh, we ponder these words of yours today from Scripture about the importance of making our actions follow our words and doing your will. Help everyone to understand not only why we are in El Salvador, but why in each person's life, everyone has the opportunity to follow your will, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, what, what, what we've discovered here as we read this uh, passage from the Gospels is that Jesus had a problem. Now, Jesus was sinless, but that didn't mean that he didn't run into problems, right? His disciples argued amongst themselves. People were trying to kill him. People didn't understand what he was saying. So he had, he had this momentary problem where uh, he is trying to help his disciples who are going to be the future leaders of his church and the, and the people that love him to understand uh, exactly what it means to follow God's will. And so um, as these, as his followers drew near and as other religious leaders came in, Jesus was trying to teach what it means to be saved by grace through faith, but that your your faith then produces necessarily fruit worthy of repentance. It produces necessarily the works of goodness and righteousness. They're not divorced. And so he knew as he was teaching this, this message of grace, uh, that it could be abused, that could people could use it as just a simple identity and we're on the right team and you're not on the right team and, and we're better than you are. So he tells this parable of these two sons and the one is the good son, supposedly, who says, yeah, dad, I'll do that. I'm your boy. I've always been the good son. I'll do whatever you want, but then doesn't do it. And then you have the other surly son who says, I'm not, I'm not interested in going out there and working in your vineyard. But then later on after reflection, he decides, no, I need to do this for the father. And he goes out and does it. And then Jesus just poses 
a simple question. You see, that's that's been the truth since the beginning of time. You know, we say things like, uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is, or uh, you know, words are cheap, talk is cheap. What that simply means is, you know, even God doesn't hold truck with just a lot of God talk that's not followed up by anything. And so Jesus simply poses the question, which, which of these two sons did his father's will? And it was clear. It was the one that actually did his father's will. We're reminded when Jesus finishes up the Sermon on the Mount, which is this beautiful sermon where he's opened the gates of heaven to everyone and asked them to follow him. The way is narrow because it's following him. But the invitation is as wide as all humankind. But he says at the end, those who hear this message and hear all these this wonderful, gracious invitation in the life of the Spirit. If you hear my words and put them into practice, you're like someone who builds their house upon the rock. But if you're somebody who hears my words and doesn't put them into practice, it's like someone who builds their house on sand. And when the storm comes, great is its fall. So Jesus knows the problem he has is that his hearers will hear the words, respond to the words. We believe it. It's wonderful. It's great. It's from God. And then not follow through, not walk the walk. They talk the talk, but not walk the walk. And uh, he says, hmm. he even challenges the religious leaders, even in an offensive way and says, listen, prostitutes and tax collectors are getting into heaven before you guys because when they heard the truth they responded they didn't just talk the talk they walked the walk and so one of the reasons we're here in El Salvador is part of our divine calling as the scripture tells us is to understand our unity in Christ. It's interesting, we got here in El Salvador and on the wall behind as I preached Sunday morning, they had put up Somos Unidos in Cristo. We are united or we are one in Christ. And that's become sort of our team's theme this week. Even though I didn't Added it as the theme. God gave us the theme when we arrived. We're one in Christ. And that's really uh, why we're here. We recognize the oneness of our brothers and sisters. And we see our brothers and sisters here that have needs. And we've seen that in our church uh, for the better part of 16 years and in building this school to, for the children in the community. And it's really changed the community tremendously for the better. Uh, they now have a paved road here because of this school. There's a clinic that was built just over over the wall there because of this school. This has become a community of God, a godly community, a place where people want to live. And um, families come to this church. Um, fathers come to this church. And a lot of men are out uh, working alongside with us on this project and so um, even though we're in dire circumstances we have great joy because we are walking in God's will right now and you know the, the promises from scripture is if you'll do that you'll, you'll have an abundant life you may not have a may not be the life that uh, they market on television as the good life, but it's even greater than that because it's the abundant life that only God can give. And uh, I'm gonna take you a little bit and show you, we'll close the sermon by showing you a little bit of uh, our, our little work site here. You can see our brothers here that are uh, helping us. 
This is the building that we're working on. Tiene mensaje para los Estados Unidos? Bendiciones. Amén. All right. Alex. Alex Cordero. See, so he's uh, he's our uh, our jefe out here. General, <laughs> helping us. This is uh, the pit that we spent the uh, better part of three days digging out all this lava rock, and now we're working on the other side. You can see the team out here. Anybody have a message for the United States? Send help. Send help. <laughs> Thanks for your support. Thank you. This is for the sermon Sunday. There's Margie. So it really is a joy to be in, in the will of God, and, and we're just blessed and thankful. And uh, I can't think of a better way to close the sermon other than say, uh, let's pray. I'm getting in Lord's way here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of serving you. I thank you so much for the privilege of serving my brothers and sisters all over this world to recognize that uh, we are one in you, that we have one Lord, one baptism, one faith, and that when we live together in harmony, it helps us to have, get a foretaste of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. And uh, Lord, everybody hearing this can, can serve in their own way. Uh, but uh, Lord, you give us your spirit to help us to walk in your way that leads to life. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a holy day.